So, welcome to this session on Universal Design for Learning and Assessment. I'm Kevin Merry from De Montfort University in Leicester. And for the last six or seven years, really, the main thrust of my work at DMU has been centred around uh, the institution-wide adoption of Universal Design for Learning. So that's not to say that we've got that cracked, so we know exactly what we're doing. It is very much an iterative journey. But what I'm going to share with you are some of the things that we've learned as an institution about UDL, but specifically about assessment. Because I often find that assessment in UDL is kind of like the elephant in the room. It's the bit that colleagues tend to find most challenging when it comes to adopting a universal design for learning approach. But one of the main reasons for that, I think, is because there is a number of myths that tend to persist around UDL and assessment. So, you know, this idea that you can offer students ultimate choice as to how they want to be assessed. So, you know, they can pick an essay or they can pick, a, you know, a piece of interpretive dance. It doesn't work like that, okay? Um, we do obviously think about flexibility and options and choices, but obviously they're within a specific context. They always have to be measuring whatever the assessment intends to measure and also in the most authentic way possible as well. So we'll try not to pick... Uh, one or two of those things as we go through. In terms of what I'm going to cover, I want to take things back to basics a little bit and get us to think about what the purpose of assessment actually is and the role it plays in terms of learning. Because actually, it plays a really important role in supporting learners to meet the goals or outcomes for learning, whatever they may be, but we often tend to think about it as kind of like the final hurdle rather than part of the process. It's kind of the output, it's the thing at the end, isn't it? It's the transactional exchange. You know, I teach you, you give me assessment, I say whether it's good, bad or indifferent. Whereas actually, if it's embedded more into the process of learning, it can actually be far better in terms of supporting that, that student mastery of whatever it is they're trying to, to learn at that given point in time. We're going to talk about the UDL principles. So I don't know how au fait everybody is with Universal Design for Learning. UDL is effectively a design framework that takes into account learner variability. OK, so learner variability is effectively all those things that makes learners different from each other. And all those factors, all those variable factors will ultimately impact upon the way in which a learner approaches and engages with their learning. Now, some of the sources of variability are very obvious. So if we think about students with specific learning differences versus students without specific learning differences, we would expect those students to engage and approach with learning in different ways. However, some of those sources of variability might be more nuanced. So cultural background, racial background are sources of learner variability. Uh, the emotional response to learning is a source of learner variability. Okay. So we'll try and unpick some of those ideas as we go through, and we'll talk about how they link to the three key UDL principles, which I'll explain as we go along. I'm going to go through some important UDL assessment considerations, so like a series of takeaways, really. I'm not going to have all the answers about UDL and assessment. We couldn't probably cover that in an hour. But what I will do is provide you with some quick and dirty takeaway tips that you can utilise to make your assessments more accessible, inclusive and equitable as far as is possible in your context. And then we'll think about how you can evaluate your own assessment approaches from a UDL perspective. So you can actually have a look at the assessments that you currently use with your learners or any assessments that you're thinking about creating and evaluate those assessments through a UDL lens. So I'm hoping that this will be quite a practical and applied session that people can take things away from rather than sort of a philosophical or theoretical debate about the merits of, of UDL. The first thing I want us to do, though, is a quick reflective activity. OK, so I want you to think about the question that's on the screen. I want you to think about what assessment is and why we do it. And you can either think about this on your own in a reflective fashion, or you can discuss this with the people next to you. Um, I don't mind how you do that. I'm going to give you three minutes to have a think about that, and I'm going to take some feedback from you at the end of the activity. <coughs> Starting now. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm Matt. 
often tell us that we're awful at it. So what is it and why do we do it? Anyone? It's a, it's a, I think it's a judgment of whether their, their ability to meet the learning outcomes of the module. Absolutely, yeah. It's certainly a judgment, isn't it? And it's certainly related to learning outcomes. So absolutely. Anybody expand on that any further? There are elements of needs analysis as well in terms of ongoing needs analysis. Oh, I like that. Yeah. So it can be, can't it? It can be very diagnostic. If we, if we need it to be, particularly if we're looking at formative type assessments, uh, we can also use summative assessments to be diagnostic as well, can't we? As in that in that regard, anything else that anybody wants to add? So, um, as an, a way to understand what's going on in students' lives, it certainly can be. Yeah. So you can teach time management, um, how to manage stress, yeah. and all of those issues. One of the things we were discussing is when you have those formative assessments. Um, they're wonderful in that you can give lots of feedback and students always complain that they don't get sufficient enough feedback but we're also perplexed by you know what are the reasons that a lot of students don't take up that opportunity yeah yeah absolutely so I think you've raised a really important point there because one of the key purposes of assessment is to provide an outlet for feedback, isn't it? Mm. And you know a lot of higher education teaching is very much based on the idea of constructivism. So we learn based on what we construct for ourselves, but quite frequently what we construct can be incorrect, can't it? Um, if anybody ever doubts the merits of constructivism as a theory of learning, speak to a small child about a very adult topic. So ask them about politics, religion, love, relationships. They'll be able to tell you something about them, might be gobbledygook, but they've constructed an idea of those things for themselves. Ultimately, they need some feedback to modify their understanding. So feedback is absolutely massive in the learning process. 
And assessments provide us with an outlet for feedback, don't they? And, and part of the feedback that they're getting from, um, from outside, from the teachers, is also to create a situation for their own intrinsic feedback to yeah. be generated. Which is very important. Yeah, so, yeah, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk a little bit about self-regulation, self-feedback, self-evaluation as we go through. So that's really good. So there's a little bit of a, a sort of stock answer, I guess, to this to this question: the intentional and methodical collection, interpretation, and utilization of information by teachers on their learners relating to how well their learners understand the given topic or concept. So effectively, it's a gauge, isn't it, for how well learners have learned whatever it is we want them to learn. I think the word gauge is quite accurate because we must always remember that an assessment is only ever an approximation of learning until such a time that we're able to look into the brains of our learners and see the neural connections that represent learning. We can only have that approximation. I mean, we probably will be able to look into their brains one day, won't we, with the way technology is going. We don't need to assess them. We'll just look. Yeah, you've learned it. Thanks. Be twenty thousand pounds, please, for that degree, or whatever it cost at that time. Twenty thousand pounds a year, that is. Um, but until such time, we obviously have to find an approximation of how well they've learned. And because it's only an approximation, it probably makes it even more important that we get it that we get it right that actually it's an authentic, true measure of whatever it is we're trying to measure. Assessment is also one of the core constituents of intentional learning design. So this idea around intentional learning design is a very UDL idea. So Rose Mayer and Gordon came up with this particular uh, framework. It's not particularly groundbreaking. It includes four things that we've all come across many, many times, but they are important to think about from an intentional design perspective. So there are the learning goals or the learning outcomes, the assessments, the teaching and learning methods and the materials. And all of these things will interlink to support a student learning experience. They don't just sort of float around in isolation. From a UDL perspective, we would often say that the outcomes are going to be fixed. So the learning outcomes or learning goals are often non-negotiable. They are what they are, OK? But the other constituent parts, there is potential for flexibility. So there is flexibility potentially in the teaching methods, there is flexibility in the materials, and there is the potential for flexibility in the assessments as well. One thing I'll come on to as we talk in a little bit more depth about the UDL principles is this idea that the goals of learning are separate from the means of achieving them, okay, when we talk about UDL. So everybody might share the same learning goals or learning outcomes, but an individual learner's pathway to that learning outcome or that goal might be completely individualized based on their needs. And usually those needs are about reducing or removing barriers. So if we have dyslexic learners, for example, and the only learning pathway that we've got involves listening to a lecture, going to a seminar and reading tons and then writing tons to demonstrate your understanding, which is pretty much what my degree looked like then that could create barriers for certain types of learners, say dyslexic learners. It might also create a barrier for a learner that doesn't have a great command of English, for example. So this isn't about saying, well, we're going to completely get rid of reading and writing from the curriculum. All it means is that we provide a potential alternative that that student can use if there is a barrier that needs to be reduced or removed. So the purpose of UDL has two main ideas behind it. Um, we say that the purpose of UDL is to support learners to become expert learners, okay? And expert learning is about two key things. It's about mastery of learning content. So this is about being able to apply a range of practical and cognitive skills to the content of your learning. So this is kind of what we do in education, isn't it? We try and make people knowledgeable and skilled in whatever it is we're teaching them, English language, engineering, nursing, sports science, whatever it might be. The other part of being an expert learner, though, is probably slightly more important. And this is about supporting learners to gain personal knowledge of how they master that learning content, because everybody will master it in a slightly different way. OK, so there's a very large metacognitive element to universal design for learning. There's a very large learning to learn element. So we're not just teaching people content and saying, brilliant, you understand engineering or nursing or whatever. We're trying to make them more effective learners in the general sense so that they can transfer those skills beyond university. There's a lifelong learning element 
to universal design that can be transferred to multiple contexts. The important thing to remember about assessment, though, is that it will impact on both of these things. So if we think about summative assessment, that's primarily the way we actually determine whether a learner has mastered the content of their learning, isn't it? So we have modules, we have programs, we have outcomes related to those things, we have assessments related to those things to see how well they understand whatever it is we're trying to teach them. However, there's other parts of the assessment process that will support this metacognition. So a couple of people already mentioned self-assessment and self-reflection and self-regulation, actually understanding what works best for you in any given context. So one of the silly examples I like to use in relation to this is if ever I buy a piece of furniture from Ikea, rather than read the instructions, I go on YouTube and watch a video. Because I know that I will build that piece of furniture much better if I watch a video rather than read the instructions. I'll get frustrated reading the instructions. I'm a really impatient person, so I don't want to read them. I get bored reading them. I find them difficult to follow, so I'd much prefer to use a video. But I understand that about myself, so I won't even look at the instructions. I know I have that personal knowledge that the video is going to work better for me. And although that's a daft analogy to use, it works along the same principle. Same. <laughs> UDL is comprised of three core principles, okay? And we say that learners are variable across these three areas. Now, this is underpinned by neuroscience, and that's quite involved and sort of heavy going, a bit heavy for a Thursday morning, so we won't go into that too much. But all we will say is that le learners will be variable across these three areas. So the engagement area is pretty much about how we get learners interested in what they learn and how we keep them motivated but also how we keep them persisting with their learning in the face of challenge. So when it gets difficult, okay, when it gets frustrating, when it gets boring, when it feels like there's a lot to do, there's a mountain to climb, what is it that we can do to keep them at it rather than giving up? And there's a big element of self-regulation in that. Engagement is very much tied to the assessment process. So we've all done types of assessment that frankly are quite boring, haven't we? Things that we don't really look forward to. Has anybody ever started an assessment not that long before it's due in because you just couldn't be bothered to get started with it? I know I certainly have, particularly if it's a long and laborious written output like an essay. It's like, I know I can do it and I think I'll do okay in it. I just can't really be bothered to start because it's a bit boring. It's not really engaging me. So there's a big engagement piece around assessments, particularly in terms of authenticity. So the more we can make them authentic, particularly in occupational and professional contexts, the better, because it interests us and it keeps us engaged. As I mentioned, there's also a self-regulatory aspect of our engagement. So how can we support learners to stick with assessments when they're struggling with them, when they're finding it hard to get their head around the content, and they're finding it hard actually to, to get their ideas down on paper? And we'll talk a little bit more about self-regulation as we go through. Then we've got representation. So representation is about the information that's related to learning. And it exerts its greatest influence on learning resources and learning materials. So again, this has a big part to play in the assessment process. Most of the information that we provide our learners with around assessment is written down, isn't it, in handbooks. So we provide background information, we provide assessment briefs, we provide marking criteria, we provide rubrics, and they all tend to be written down in text-based form. So it's sometimes worth thinking about if those thinking about whether that information could be presented in alternative ways. OK. Um, not only that, quite often when we assess in higher education, we throw around these really kind of fancy verbs, don't we? Like you must critically evaluate and critically analyze and define and distinguish. But it's really important that the learners know what those things mean. We all know what they mean because we wrote the assessment. All right. But it's more important that the learners know what those things mean and know how they need to demonstrate those things if they're going to do a good job in their assessment. So providing something like a glossary that defines those terms along with the assessment can be really, really helpful. The number of assessment briefs I've read and background instructions that I've ever read both as a lecturer and an educational developer, where I've looked at it and I've gone, I'm not quite sure what it's asking the students to do. I've lost count. OK, and this is a representation issue as well. So me looking at YouTube instead of the instructions 
from the IKEA furniture is a representation issue. Okay, I'd much prefer to use an alternative resource. Then finally, we have action and expression. So action and expression is about our output in response to a learning stimulus. It's about how we demonstrate our understanding and it's about how we communicate. So this has the closest relevance to the design of assessments, although all three are relevant and they're often overlapping and interlinked. So the example I'd like to use for this one is imagine if you had to program your central heating boiler and you'd forgotten how to do it, OK? Which people are probably doing that at the moment, aren't they, because it's freezing. You've forgotten how to do it. The only way that you can find out how to do it is through a 150-page manual that you've got on the boiler, OK? It doesn't tell you in the contents page what page you need to skip to to learn how to program the boiler. So that's both an engagement issue because you're thinking, well, I don't really want to read 150 pages on the boiler. It's boring. I haven't got time. I'm freezing. It's frustrating. It's also a representation issue as well, though, isn't it? Because if that's your only resource, how else can you do it? Let's say there isn't a video for you to, to look at or there isn't a quick, uh, a quick start guide or something like that for you to look through. Because of those engagement and representation issues, your ability to program the boiler, which is to press the correct buttons on the boiler in the correct sequence, which is the action expression part, is compromised. OK, you're not going to press the right buttons on the boiler in the right sequence because you're bored and because you can't find the information you need because the resources you've got aren't very good. So these things will all have an impact on each other. So a student's ability to demonstrate their understanding might be impacted upon what we do here and here. OK, so if it's boring, if it's not a particularly interesting assessment, if it's not very authentic, it's going to affect their ability to express themselves. And also, if the information that supports that, uh, that assessment isn't very good, isn't very clear, isn't very helpful, it's also going to impact upon their ability to demonstrate their understanding or their knowledge as well. So these things don't exist in isolation, as it were. So the first takeaway from a UDL perspective is to think about assessment holistically as having three parts. So we talk about assessment of learning, which is summative assessment. We have to have that. We can't get away from it, can we? Any modules or programs that we teach on will tend to have summative assessments that the students must complete in order to complete the module or the program or whatever. Then we have assessment for learning, which is uh, formative assessment. So formative assessment is a really important outlet for feedback, but it's also a really important outlet for us as teachers to differentiate our teaching. So based on how well students do in the formative assessment will impact upon what we then do subsequently with those students and how we group them and differentiate them. So it's a really, really important tool to use. OK. Finally, we have assessment as learning. So this is self-assessment. OK, so this is where learners self evaluate how they're getting on with their learning. It might also involve getting them to think about how they feel from an emotional perspective, recognising their emotional responses to given uh, learning situations such as assessments. Let's face it, most students get quite anxious around being assessed, don't they? Particularly if it's, say, an exam. So raising their awareness of how they're feeling and then supporting them to find ways of dealing with those particular feelings and emotional challenges can be really, really important. Yes? No, no, no comment. Um, from that, that, I mean, I've always, I've always have a, that problem with the, that direct relationship between assessment of learning as to summative and assessment for learning as formative. And then this other thing, which is the learner self said, What I mean is that, um, is that is somehow summative assessment is also assessment for learning and it's also assessment of course learning. yeah of course of course yeah it can be the point about this is to make sure that all three parts are covered effectively so to make sure that we're trying at least where we can to do all three to provide assessment formatively as an outlet for feedback but also to support us in terms of differentiating our learning but also to get the learners to think about where they are themselves so to self-assess, they might even peer assess as well. They might look at each other's work and provide feedback to each other. And I'll provide a, a working example of how we did that at DMU on our PG cert as we go through a little bit later on. But you're absolutely right, yeah. The summative process can involve all of these things because ultimately 
we will be supporting learners to achieve learning outcomes through the summative assessment process, won't we? Yeah. But that's kind of the first takeaway, really, is to, where possible, try and include those three aspects. Okay, got another quick three minute reflective activity for you to have a think about. Again, you can do this with the people next to you or you can reflect on it individually. What do you think the most important thing to get right is when creating an assessment? All right, I'm going to give you another three minutes starting now. Mm. <laughs> Bit of a trick question. This one. It was on the ticket. It was really because Well, it isn't. It isn't. In the front, it isn't. That was boring. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. it's. Uh, <laughs> I think it's right. Like, um, <laughs> yeah. I suppose it's well worth. I'm really impressed that my timer's worked actually. Whenever I do this through Teams, it seems to interfere with the timer and they don't work to get stuck, but it's worked. So. I didn't even notice it. So engrossing the learning. Yeah. Yeah. Like, ideally, especially like from different yeah. modules. Engagement. Yes. Which is mostly about attention so and this commitment. This thing with the boiler, which actually happened to me That's a week ago, yeah. um, <laughs> there was an extra element of engagement, which was a, a cold wife standing with arms folded. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. And yeah. how well, yeah. that fits in with yeah. paradigm. Yeah, yeah. pressure. Yeah. yeah. Emotion, yeah. Emotional yeah. responses. <laughs> okay, so let's have some feedback. What do we need to get right, most importantly of all? Anyone? We talked about alignment and um, validity and reliability. Oh, perfect, brilliant. Alignment. It's got to align, okay? It must have clear and direct alignment with the learning goals or the learning outcomes. It absolutely has to do that. It has to be an authentic measure of what it intends to measure, all right? So, Learning goals or the learning outcomes will give rise to what we call an assessment construct. Okay, the construct is the thing that the assessment intends to measure. All right, so the reason that says focus first on what is being assessed rather than how is because lots of higher education staff tend to get this the wrong way around. They think about is it going to be a poster or an essay or a video or a blah 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 before they think about what it is that is actually being assessed from a construct perspective. Now, it goes without saying that the construct becomes really, really fuzzy and unclear if the learning outcomes aren't written particularly well, okay? And if there's like 
40 of them. So we've been in a, in a situation at De Montfort recently where we've been kind of rewriting our entire curriculum for block delivery, which is, well, I'll tell you all about it one day. <laughs> It's a long story. Um, but we've had to go across every single module and every single program looking at the learning outcomes. And it was quite a sobering experience actually to see how many outcomes for modules weren't particularly well written. They were really vague. They were asking students to do lots of different things. And you're thinking, well, how are you going to assess that? So there has to be real alignment and clarity between the outcomes or the goals and that assessment construct. Because quite often, and I'll come on to this a little bit later on. What we tend to find is that assessments will possess irrelevant constructs. So things that the learners are being assessed on, but it was never the intention to assess those things. And we'll have a look at some examples of that a little bit later on as we go through. But that's that's the key thing in relation to that. I mean, you could argue authenticity, etc. But all these things are interrelated anyway. So here's an example of a really poorly written learning outcome on completion of this unit. You will understand the anatomy of the human heart. Difficult to assess that. Why is it difficult to assess that? Sorry, say that again, someone. It's a complex organ. Well, yeah, but what does understanding look like? How are we measuring understanding? Yeah. OK, so. I'm sure you're all out of the habit by now of not putting the word understand in your learning outcomes. But if not, this will hopefully reiterate the importance of avoiding vague terms like that. Yeah. A it's better not term. Not yeah. Answer, yeah. On completion of this unit, you will be able to label the major anatomic structures found in the human heart. Much easier to measure from an assessment perspective. Because all we're looking for the learners to do is label the major anatomical structures found in the human heart. Now, this gets a little bit more complicated and we get into this whole relevant, irrelevant constructs part. If we didn't provide the learners with the labels, OK, we would also be asking them to remember the labels as well as spell them correctly, which isn't part of the assessment. OK. So we would be adding irrelevant constructs if we were to do that, in which case we would have to give them a list of the correct labels and say put them in the right place to make that a valid construct relevant assessment. And that might, make, might seem like an obvious thing, but you'd be amazed how often things like that get missed. All you've got to do is label the diagram. Yeah, but what are the labels? You haven't provided them, so they've got to remember them. My background is anatomy and physiology. So anybody that's ever studied that will know that, you know, spelling can be a challenge when we're thinking about anatomy and physiology. Are we asking the students to spell the things correctly? Well, according to the outcome, no, we're not. In which case we have to be careful about those construct relevant and irrelevant factors. And I've got another example, probably an example that most people will be able to recognize actually from their own educational experiences that shows relevant and irrelevant constructs. Was there a hand that yeah, possible? So just, yeah. just a quick one that's just, just personal for me, it might help me but just make a few. So I've just inherited the module and one of the, the question was basically under, explain in two ways sport has changed in the last 60 years or 100 years. So then would you be saying then I should provide the students with the ways so they could choose from? Or is that now? Ooh, well it, it depends really what that assessment intends to assess yet. So I think it would be more I think it would be more effective if they were provided some steer in relation to what it was you were expecting them to write about yet. So because that's an exceptionally broad question, isn't it? Well yeah and even I mean, the term you can say, well you know yeah. the, the grass on football pitches is greener <laughs> than it was in the <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or there's more grass on the pitches than there were in the or you know it's you could I mean you could take that literally anywhere, couldn't you? So, yeah, okay. I, I would probably give a little bit of a steer and say these are the kind of things that you perhaps need to be yeah. discussing. One of the things that's always been a bugbear for me about the assessment process, <coughs> um, and it still persists a little bit, is that this, there's this sort of undercurrent of it's there to catch people out a little bit. I'll make it really wide and vague because you might screw it up, you know, or actually 
the assessment's there to kind of separate those that listen and turn up from those that don't. Well, no, it's not actually there to serve that purpose, is it? And I mean, we talked a little bit about emotional intelligence uh, previously, but the kind of language that, that lecturers use around assessment is really important because students absorb that and start to think, oh, I feel under so much pressure because they're saying it's going to be really difficult and challenging and this is going to separate those that have turned up from those that haven't. And actually, I haven't turned up for the last three weeks because I've got childcare commitments and I've got a job. And, you know, it, it's really important, I think, to frame it in the right way and to make things transparent, clear, uh, is, is really, really important. So, yeah, that was a good, that was a good contribution. Thank you for that. Actually, might find help. Just reboot my work with me, so thank you. That's all. Happy to help. The lady in the so, here we go then, folks. It's another quick, uh, quick task for you to do. Uh, imagine that your learners are about to sit a biology exam. The purpose of the exam is to test biology knowledge. Of course, the exam lasts two hours. The learners do not know the questions that they will be asked in the exam and they are not allowed to access any resources during the exam. So they can't take in a textbook. So it's it's closed book and it's unseen effectively. And they must hand write their answers, okay, in old school fashion. So they're gonna sit in a freezing cold sports hall for two hours and bang out whatever on, on biology. And I'm sure we've all done this, uh, you know, many times in the past. What's wrong with that assessment? I'm gonna give you three minutes to have a chat about that. It looks like an A level, yeah, um, also, why exactly what it is. Think about think about a profession that would need to have a working knowledge of biology. So say 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 this was something we were going to do with a group of pre-service nurses. Would that be an authentic way for them to demonstrate their biology knowledge from an occupational perspective? Depending on the subject discipline. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like say it's cool and it's just. I think it's like an exam yesterday. 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 I think it's like an they will I, allow you to do another of We almost count the number of exams I've done. You've got that choice to do it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Choose how I... Yeah, I don't know. To be honest, I, I don't know what to do that for the university. Not given the best way. He says that the question will be on three possible topics, but you won't know which one it is. You've effectively got three things in the cluster areas that you can do it. And a bunch of people who say it's a paper, we've just got it on there. Because they're not going to back them if you want to talk it. And the topic that it was, and you know. Okay, what's wrong with this then, folks? So many things. But what? The word knowledge, I guess. Uh, assessing assessing knowledge is very general, isn't it? It is, yeah, it is. Yeah, we would we would go with that. We would probably want a much more 
functional description of what that means, wouldn't we? In, in practice, yeah, absolutely. So we'll take that on board. What else is wrong with it? It's not authentic. It isn't authentic, very good. Why isn't it authentic? No one would ever need to do that. <laughs> exactly. So I mentioned to this group, imagine if this was a group of pre-service nurses that were going to take this exam because they need biology knowledge. Would they ever have to demonstrate their biology knowledge as a nurse by sitting a two-hour exam? No. No. And the interesting thing is that issues such as this persist in lots of different areas of life. I had a job interview two years ago for a job I obviously didn't get. Um, not bitter about it, obviously. Um, I won't say where it was for. And one of the uh, one of the things I had to do was give a presentation with no visual aids. Well, why is that? Why is that assessing my memory skills? So if I get the job here, then everything you ask me to do, I've just got to pull it from memory. I'm never allowed to look at anything. I'm never allowed to read anything. I've just literally got to go. Mm, yeah. All right then. Not authentic, is it? What else is wrong with it? I have an issue with the handwriting because, mm -hmm. yes, you know, yes. It's, it's a skill that really doesn't demonstrate. You see, that, that there are lot of individuals that have a problem with it. Yeah. They can express themselves in that. Yeah. Way. It's testing biology knowledge, not your handwriting skills. Anybody got bad handwriting? <laughs> I think it's good to understand. How did you feel then? <laughs> With your bad handwriting, if ever you had to do a handwritten exam, do you think, oh, I'm going to have to write really slowly so it's legible, but I haven't got time because I've only got two hours, yeah? So really, what this is about is it's showing how irrelevant constructs can really easily be designed into the assessment process, okay? Because it's supposed to be testing biology knowledge, but it's testing time management skills, it's testing memory. It's testing organisation, it's testing handwriting, as well as a bunch of other things. And if it was never the intention to assess those things, then it's disadvantaging some learners, isn't it? All right. So you could argue that, you know, people that could demonstrate their biology knowledge really well in a different context might do really badly. And we go, I'm ever so sorry, but you haven't achieved, you know, in that context. On the flip side, we could UDLify that particular approach by maybe removing the restrictive time limits on it. So if we were to give um, you know, some learners, say, 20% extra time, why don't we give everybody 20% extra time? I might need the extra time because my handwriting is really bad. Not because I'm dyslexic or because I have a specific learning difference or anything like that. It's just that I don't write very well and I get tired. It's hard writing non-stop for two hours, isn't it? Why don't we say, to, yeah, why don't we show them what the question is beforehand? Yeah? Why don't we give them a resource like a textbook that they can take in with them? If there's not that many of them, can't we let them word process their answers? It's far easier to mark. Anybody ever marked a handwritten exam script? <laughs> yeah. What does it look like on the third page? Are you like turning it off? You know, it's like, what does that say again? You show it to your colleague. And so, you know, I'm not a massive fan of exams. I think they measure what comes out of a pen on any given day. Um, but that's not to say that we must get rid of all exams, but we can make them more accessible, can't we? And more inclusive and more equitable to a certain extent by modifying one or two things about them. Um, so that's taken away three, really. Always look for and remove barriers. So irrelevant constructs will be a clear barrier. So always have a look at your assessments and think, is this assessing anything that is not the intention to assess? whether it be handwriting, memory, organisational skills, etc. There'll be an authenticity element to that as well. OK, so talking about nurses, you know, it's probably more authentic for a nurse to demonstrate biology knowledge in consultation with a patient than it would be doing a two hour exam, for example. We've already talked a little bit about background information and instructions. Are they clear and are they available in multiple formats or you know, is it like reading War and Peace just to actually decipher what it is you have to do as part of that particular um, assessment? Limited options. We'll talk a little bit about options on the next slide. Sometimes options, i.e. you can pick an essay or something else, isn't always available. And I'll explain why that is, but sometimes it will be depending on the context. 
And then we've talked a little bit about the social and emotional demands as well. So there are four basic emotions, happiness, sadness, fear, and anger, all right? It can be quite useful to think about where those emotions might occur in your assessment processes. So happiness, one of the antecedents of happiness is reward. So if you provide lots of formative assessment, you're providing lots of outlets for reward because you're giving feedback praise, yeah? However, if people put on, get put on the spot and say, right, I didn't tell you about this last week, but you've got a test today, that makes people a bit fearful. It also might make them a little bit angry because they might go, well, I haven't, I haven't revised. How am I expected to do well if you haven't told me about it? But the irrelevant constructs tend to be the key thing to look out for in terms of barriers. Um, if we're thinking about what's being assessed, a good thing to, to use as a rough guide really is to think about whether you are primarily assessing skills or whether it's primarily knowledge. There might be a mixture of both, but as far as you can, try and make the separation because if it's skills based, there is less scope for flexibility in the output. So if we were all doing a public speaking course right now, what would the assessment have to be? Yes, a public speaking task. It wouldn't be authentic to write an essay about it, would it? Or provide a poster. It would have to be a public speaking task, so it's, there is less scope for flexibility. The flexibility, though, might be in the topic, so we might say, well, you can do that public speech on whatever you like, any topic that you like, because if we personalise it, it's going to improve your engagement. OK, we might also provide some flexibility in terms of the approach. So there is more than one way to plan and deliver a public speech, isn't there? There's multiple ways. We could do it by asking questions. We could do it through storytelling. We could do it any way we want to do it. So we would encourage the learners to explore whatever approach works best for them. The authenticity in these assessments is often built in. OK, so if we're doing a public speaking course, you're going, to do, you're going to do a public speaking test. So on our, we get our, um, our, our brand new teachers, those that are new to higher education at DMU, we give them a three-day intensive introduction to learning and teaching course. And on the third day, that course culminates in them doing a micro-teaching task. So they have to teach for 20 minutes. It's like, you're here to be a teacher. Like, we can't assess your teaching skills by getting you to write about them. You've got to actually demonstrate straight them in an authentic way. If it's primarily knowledge, then there's greater scope for flexibility, okay? Like we looked at the biology exam. So we can test biology knowledge using an exam, but there's multiple other ways that we could also test that knowledge, isn't there? We could do a viva, we could do some sort of practical task, we could get them to write a poster, create a video, far more flexibility. However, the key thing with knowledge is to always aim for authenticity, okay? So again, it wouldn't be authentic for your pre-service nurses to do an exam. It would be more authentic to do a consultation with a patient, for example. Yeah, it's more authentic for a teacher to be assessed by doing some teaching, yeah, than saying write an essay or something like that. You know, I did a, I've been doing a bit of work with universities HR. Don't worry, I don't work for HR. I'm not, I'm not the enemy. Um, it was purely about looking at recruitment and selection processes in universities and um, how inaccessible and inauthentic they can often be. So I talked about, you know, do a presentation with no visual aids. What, what's authentic about that? The number of institutions that don't actually get people to teach as part of their interview for a teaching role is quite shocking, really. So wouldn't you want to know whether they can actually engage with some learners and build some rapport and actually, you know, structure the session well and have some learning outcomes and this kind of thing, rather than just look at the publication output. You know, that's not really, that doesn't make you a good teacher, does it? So authenticity is really important, but we must always try and minimise these irrelevant constructs where possible. So I'm going to give you a, an example of an assessment that we used on our PG cert uh, at DMU that try to incorporate as much of this UDL methodological approach as we possibly could. So this was an assessment for our first module, which is called Developing Your Teaching Practice. And the output, the thing they have to do, the summative output, is a reflective screencast. Okay, so they have to do a 20-minute screencast 
using uh, Panopto software, which we rebranded and called it DMU Replay. All right. Now, the reason we did that is because it's mandatory at the Montfort University, and it has been since 2016, to record your staff-led teaching sessions. All right. So we said, well, look, they've got to do this as a mandatory requirement. So we might as well get them doing it as part of the assessment. It's authentic. Um, not only that, it will give them knowledge and experience of the software if they've never used it before. Um, and actually, post-pandemic, during the pandemic, we've all been creating asynchronous learning materials, haven't we? Which is that as well, so it's a very authentic thing to do. The approach we took to that was a patchwork style approach. So basically, what the learners do, or the participants do, is they create a patch of formative assessment pretty much each week. And that formative assessment is linked to the final summative output, okay? They have to create a separate summative output, but they've effectively done the work by, by doing these formative patches. We said that they could do the formative patches in any format they wanted. If they wanted to write them, they can write them. If they wanted to create a podcast, you can create a podcast. If you want to do a video, you can do a video, poster, do a poster, however you like. They would bring each patch to subsequent sessions, do some self-evaluation on the patch. They would do some peer evaluation on the patch, so they would swap and give feedback to each other. And then effectively, they would help build up that kind of learning, um, a learning journey, really, that would lead them eventually to the screencast piece. So this has obviously got flexibility because we've allowed them to create the patches in whatever form they want. It's got elements of uh, assessment of, for, and as learning built in. It's got authenticity built in, and it worked really well because actually it got the staff doing the kind of things that they would do in their role as a teacher. You will be required to record your lectures. You will be required to create asynchronous learning materials. So why don't we make those the assessments as opposed to a 3,000 word essay on constructivism? When are you ever gonna write a 3,000 word essay on constructivism in your role as a teacher? You're probably not, are you? Okay, so that's just one way that we try to embed these UDL approaches into our practices. And it worked really well. The students had a really good time doing this. What we tried to do with the patches, we said, look, it would be useful if the patches were created in multimedia form where possible, because obviously the output is multimedia and it's improving your digital capabilities. But if not, then you don't have to do it that way. Our external examiner absolutely loved that, actually, by the way. They thought that was a really innovative approach to the assessment. Kevin, can I just ask, what, what do you mean by patches? I might be... So literally, it's a piece of formative assessment right. that they were provided with every week that they had to complete. Right. They completed it for the following week and brought it with them. The patch would be related to this, so to the final screencast. Right. All right? Yes, what does, sorry, I don't know, sorry, I don't know how many of the software, but what's the screencast? Is it, every, is it just a video recording of a session? Yeah, it was, it was done using Panopto. Panopto. So, so, so they, could, they, they can only do Panopto? No, 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 so, so obviously it's mandatory for them to use Panopto, but as part of our lecture recording policy, you can also utilise an, um, an equitable alternative. Okay. So we said, if you want to utilise an equitable alternative instead of Panopto, you can also do that as well. Where, so, was, where was feedback in this process, in terms of the formative tasks? So, on a week-by-week -week basis, literally. Yeah. So there was self-evaluation, there was peer feedback, and there would also have been teacher feedback as well in the sessions, because the sessions were like half a day, and there would always be time given over to review each of the patches, yeah? Yeah. So do you remember offhand any um, example of like a finished um, screencasting and how the, each piece of the puzzle, do you remember any of the? Any yeah, so like some of these patches would have been um, things like uh, obtaining feedback from your learners. You know, what was your experience of doing that? How did you do it? How effective was it? How was it used? Another one might be what information do you derive on your learners? So that you can support them. So how do you understand the variability of your learners, and then how do you cater for it? Another one might have been, you know, what key pedagogic approaches are you utilising in your context? So if you learn in a very, ex or if you teach in a very experiential way, like if you're teaching on a program that's got a heavy placement element, let's say, then we get you to think about that and reflect upon that. And effectively, they they stitch the patches together. That's what we use. That's the term we use. Uh, 
and then literally put it all into the screencast at the end. So they've done the work, they, have, they can't just submit the patches. Um, some, sometimes that happens in a, in, a, in a sort of portfolio type approach, but we didn't do that. We just said, look, take the learning from here, transfer it to the screencast and talk about it, and then that's your output. But effectively, it made the completion of the sortative part easier because they've done all the work here and had feedback on it, they've reflected on it, thought about it, and gone through it in that way. They might have used some kind of presentation software there in their screencast. They could have done, yeah, if they wanted to, yeah. Yeah. As I say, because we have this equitable alternatives policy, we said, well, you can use an equitable alternative if you don't want to use the software, because that's realistic. So if you were teaching in an area where there might be some confidential information shared, let's say, then it wouldn't necessarily be the right thing to do to record it. So we have you know, courses on um, like things like probation and things like this, you know, they might be talking about real cases, then use an equitable alternative. So it had those options for flexibility in it as well. But again, you could argue that there's a slight sort of skills element to that, isn't there? Because they've got to do it as part of their job. So, but we left that, we left that up to them. Okay. I'm just conscious of, of time. So I'm not going to talk too much through this. This is just a quick assessment, quick start guide that we provide to our staff. Uh, just as a reminder, really, of things to think about. Um, so alignment with learning outcomes, making sure you've got verbs. We tend to sort of say make sure those verbs align to Bloom's taxonomy, particularly the higher order cognitive skills, depending on the level. Uh, objects for the verb. So this is about sort of saying, you know, we want you to create an informed viewpoint in the form of a report. So actually align an object with whatever verb you're using. Clear evidence of achievement, so things like rubrics and marking criteria. We talked about supplementary material, so this is mostly background information and instructions where necessary. It might be even be a glossary. So we've asked you to critically analyse, this is what we mean, and this is what it will involve. Um, and then obviously context and occupational relevance where it's possible, uh, depending on obviously the, the subject area. We'll obviously send all the slides through so you can obviously have a copy of these as well. Uh, last, very last thing, very, very quickly, if you've created an assignment or if you're about to create a new assessment, I should say, and you want to evaluate it from a UDL perspective, you can do that in two ways. There's a very high level evaluation you can do of that, which requires you to address the three key questions. OK, so first of all, how do you ensure that your assessments are linked to the learning goals? So that alignment piece, is it clearly measuring what it intends to measure? Second, how do your assessments engage or interest your learners okay so why are they going to stick with that why are they going to be motivated to want to complete that assessment all right is it occupationally relevant is it authentic and then finally and probably most importantly what barriers might learners experience when completing your assessments so think about those barriers but particularly the irrelevant constructs are they being assessed on anything that isn't the intention to assess as part of that assessment piece so handwriting time management, um, written communication if it's not absolutely essential, okay, those sorts of things. There's also a deep dive way you can do this as well, which involves looking at three key areas. So the first one is looking at the presentation of the assessment construct. And obviously that comes from the learning outcomes and it will be present in the assessment brief and background information. Is the construct clear? That is what they've got to be assessed on really, really clear to the learners. All right. I think it's a really good idea to get some learners to provide feedback on your assessment briefs and on your background information because they're the ones that are going to be using it. They don't have to be the learners that are going to take those assessments. It could be people from last year, from a different school or faculty or whatever. But quite often we assume that the learners know what we're talking about, because if it's obvious to us, we think it's going to be obvious to them, but it might not always be. Think about how they interact with the construct. OK, so most of the time, interaction with the assessment construct will involve answering a question of some sort, won't it? Whether it's in an exam or an essay or whatever. All right. But think about how they have to interact with that construct. Are they having to read a passage of text? Are they having to answer a question? Are they having to look at some images? And think about whether that's the best way for them to interact with that construct in that particular context. And then finally, how do they have to respond? 
Okay, what is it that they're actually required to do? Do they have to hand write for two hours in a freezing cold sports hall with no resources and no knowledge of the question in advance? Or are they doing it in a slightly different way? And again, thinking about the response from a barrier's point of view. Are there any barriers in there that could be at least reduced, if not removed completely? The biology example is a really good one because quite often people are very sort of polarised as to we must never have exams or like, yes, we're big fans of exams and we've got to do them all the time. And that might be dependent on whatever subject area you're in and whatever professional regulatory statutory body uh, that, that guides the quality assurance around the courses that you teach. But actually, we don't necessarily always have to get rid of exams. We can just try and make them a little bit more accessible by looking at those irrelevant constructs. Does it have to be over an oppressively timed period? Does it have to be handwritten? Can't we give them information about the question so that they know what it is in advance? OK. Can we actually provide them with some resources? The interesting thing is that all of this stuff, I've mentioned the work I've been doing with UHR, all of this stuff is really relevant to like the recruitment and selection process like you wouldn't believe. It's like how often do you get a copy of the interview questions in advance when you go into an interview? You don't know what they are, do you? You can second guess them because you look at the person spec, don't you think, well, they're probably going to ask me this, but it'd be much easier to plan and prepare if you knew what the questions were, wouldn't it? Yeah. How, how, how often does anybody ever have the foresight to take something in with them? So the job I've got at DMU, I took like an old fashioned portfolio of work in with me. They didn't tell me to do that, but I just thought it would be easier to show them stuff I've done than to try and explain it. And the feedback I got after I, I got the job was like, oh, that, that was like, yeah, that sealed the deal for you. You know, whipping out that portfolio and, and showing us what you'd done, you know, as well as explaining it was a really, really great thing to do. And it's like, yeah, but I had to take the initiative myself. You didn't suggest to me that, why don't you do that? So, you know, it's, it's really, really interesting that it, it works that way. Um, very, very last thing. I mean, I'm sure you've got observation processes in this university that you use. I like to use peer supported review because it goes beyond observation of teaching. So you can get people to provide feedback on your assessments, whether that's colleagues or even students on every aspect of it. So the background information, the brief, you know, what it is. Is it interesting? Is it authentic? Is it going to engage them? Is it going to motivate them? All right. Because I think quite often there will always be things that we haven't thought of when we've created an assessment. OK, that somebody else will pick up on, whether it's the language, whether it's the alignment to the learning outcomes. Quite often, these things get pulled together quite quickly as well, don't they? You know, when we create a module that needs to be sort of put through validation as part of a programme, the outcomes, the assessments tend to get, I don't want to say they get thrown together, but they tend to get pulled together quite quickly and it can be quite easy to, to maybe miss, miss the odd piece of quality assurance. And it's just providing a little bit of that quality assurance, isn't it? And all good learning and teaching folks, and this is where I'll finish, is iterative, you know. If an assessment isn't working particularly well, you don't have to persevere with it through thick and thin, you can change it, can't you? And actually, it takes probably three or four years for any module course or even assessment to reach a point where we might consider it to be optimum because of that iteration and those changes that we can make. Yeah. So this was the last question because I feel like where I am, the fear is that if you get really specific with a type of assessment and then you try it and it doesn't work, you're locked into that assessment because you can't make mod modifications for a year or two years. Mm. So I feel like the push and pull we get from academics is around, well, it's easier for me if I make the assessment, well, I'm going to make the learning outcome or the assessment quite vague. Quite vague, yeah, yeah. Because then it allows me to be iterative yeah. and adapt and change. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that some of the QA approaches in lots of universities are quite restrictive because why yeah. wouldn't we want to change things if the feedback suggests it should be changed? We're not locked into our teaching approaches, are we? So if I, if, you know, if I go away and think, you know what, the way I delivered this session just didn't land. People didn't enjoy it, were bored, were falling asleep, whatever, they were looking at their watches, their phones, etc. I would go away and change it for the next time that I delivered it. So why can't we do that with assessment processes, etc.? I sometimes find the red tape a little bit restrictive and the hoops to jump through. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to change that just by saying it's a gripe of mine, but I think 
you know, I think it's something that we ought to think about. Because, you know, good teaching is iterative, isn't it? We never reach a point where we've cracked it as teachers. You know, it's not like getting your driving license where that's it, you can drive now forever. You know, you've constantly got to be thinking about and modifying your practice based on constant changes. I mean, look how much we've all had to change our practice since the pandemic. I mean, I'd never even used Microsoft Teams before 2020. Use used Zoom a couple of times, but only for like conferences and stuff. Whereas now we're all kind of au fait with all these new technologies and new techniques and new approaches, aren't we? So it's constantly changing, so it has to be iterative. I'm going to stop there because I'm...